Heather. Thank you. Um, thank you for another day that we just get to pause and study your word. Thank you that you've given us your word and that it is something that um, is always a lamp to our feet and a guide to our path. And I pray that right now that you help us to um, let go of everything that has already been in our mornings or already been in our weeks, the things that are on our hearts and minds that will happen today. God, we uh, put all of those at your feet. Health concerns, um, schedules, everything going on, we put them at your feet. We ask for your leading, your guiding, your healing. We pray right now that you'll help us to be able to be fully present, clear our minds of our other distractions, that we can understand your word, that we can dive into it. I ask that you pour out your spirit into our presence to give that we may have wisdom and knowledge that comes from you, Lord. And I pray that you pour it out over me that I may only teach what is true. And I pray that we will grow closer to you during this time. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. All right, ladies. So today we're going to be Josh, uh, going through Joshua chapters three and four. We're going to be looking at the parting of the Jordan, which is not a, uh, a story that's often preached that much, which will be a lot of fun. So um, we are in week three at this point. When we start, the Israelites are still camped in Moab across the Jordan River from the city of Jericho. Uh, today, we will cross with them. This is a huge moment in the life of Israel. Um, I've mentioned that Joshua is about realized promises, that we see Yahweh as the covenant-keeping God. Um, Yahweh made that covenant with Abraham hundreds of years before, confirmed it with his offspring, that if you are faithful to me, he gives him the three Ps of the promise. You could just yell them out, ladies. What are the three Ps of our promise? It's of the, of the covenant. They are progeny. progeny. Yes, as many descendants as the stars in the sky and the sand on the shore. What else? place the land of Canaan as an everlasting um, uh, um, inheritance for his people. And then the last one, last P is promise. Exactly. That somehow through all of Abraham's descendants, the entire world is going to be blessed. So um, though this promise is given to the patriarchs while they are living in Canaan, they don't own it yet. It is not yet their land. The promise is not realized to them for over 400 years later. Um, you ladies remember the story. It's fun to remind ourselves that due to famine, Yahweh brings the Israelites to Egypt where they live for 400 years and really become their own identity at that point. But we know that's not the end game that Yahweh has always intended to bring them out of Egypt and return them to the land of Canaan. That He uses the actions of a harsh Pharaoh for his purposes that he intervenes through the person of Moses to bring um, salvation for his people, to redeem them from slavery, that he leads them through the desert journey, providing them with manna and water, quail, and then he gives them the Torah or the instruction for how to maintain his presence within their midst, that Yahweh's presence is signified by the Ark of the Covenant, which we're going to meet again today. Um, and through these 40 years, Yahweh shapes the identity of the Israelites into a people who will trust him who realize the battle is not theirs, who see that Yahweh is more powerful than any of the ancient Near Eastern gods that their neighbors worship. He alone is sovereign. He alone is good. And after the last of the older generation pass away, Yahweh assigns a new leader. His name is Joshua, good, and says, it's time, people. We're going. And remind me, I have a really fantastic song from Veggie Tales. I'm going to play you ladies at the end where it starts with, It's time. It's time. Did he just say it's time? So <laughs> it's, it's wonderful. So don't let me forget. Um, in the first week, we saw Yahweh commission Joshua go across the Jordan. Take these people with you. I'm giving you this land of Canaan. No one will be able to stand against you because I am with you. That's the promise, the promise of presence and relationship. And I asked last week, ladies, is that our commission? Are we supposed to go take a certain land and make it into a holy nation? And the answer is no, no that's not our commission. It's important to emphasize that it's not that we have a different God. It's, I mentioned that it's what theologians 
call progressive revelation, that God works in different ways through different time periods towards his full purpose, his end game. And do you remember the example I gave you, ladies, the analogy last week? It's like doing what? Baking a cake, remember? That you don't just throw all the ingredients in and call it cake, right? You start with your wet ingredients and you mix in your dry ingredients and then you have to bake it. And at the end, you get cake. But there's a process of getting there, right? A process of that takes different steps along the way. So, um, the Old, Te oh, the Old Testament teaches us what covenant is so that we can understand what it means that Jesus is the new covenant. We would not understand that without first seeing the idea of covenant in the Old Testament. God initially commissions Joshua to create a certain kingdom in a certain place. Why? It's for his purposes, a purpose that will culminate in eventually in Jesus. So what is Jesus's commission, ladies, is to go and do what? To go and, you can say it, to go and make disciples of all nations. Exactly. So God is still expanding his kingdom, but it's not to certain people in a certain place. His kingdom is not expanded through legislator, but through creating, but through change lives. That God is creating a people that are supposed to be separate, we Christians have never supposed to fit in. We've always been supposed to stand out, to live such purposeful, such kind lives that even as scripture says, the pagans or the unchurched will praise our father in heaven. So last week we, thought, we saw through the story of Rahab, we learned something about the people living in Canaan. What did we learn about the people living in Canaan? How are they feeling? They were all... They were all freaking out <laughs> because I mentioned that in the ancient Near East, that the, uh, there, the general belief system was polytheistic of tons and tons of gods. Now, how did people determine who were the strongest and the best gods? Do you ladies remember? It's through... If they could be your gods. If your gods can beat my gods, then your gods are bigger and stronger. So... If the Egyptians could beat the Canaanites in war, then the Egyptian gods were the stronger gods, right? Exactly. So at this time, the Egyptians controlled all of Canaan. They were the big power. They kind of left it alone to sort of do what, you know, it wanted to do, but they were the big power in charge of it. So, but the Canaanites had heard what about Yahweh and the Egyptians? Do you remember? They'd heard what? They'd heard about the Red Sea. It says that they had heard about the Red Sea because they had heard that Yahweh had beat the Egyptians in a major battle 40 years ago. They still knew about it, which meant that Yahweh was stronger than the Egyptian gods. And they'd recently heard that Yahweh had beaten these two Amorite kings, Sihon and Og, which means Yahweh is bigger and stronger than which gods than the Amorite gods, right? Exactly. So if Yahweh is bigger and stronger than the Amorite gods and bigger and stronger than the Egyptian gods, then he's likely going to be bigger and stronger than the Canaanite gods. So Rahab decided to attach herself to the winning team, to team Yahweh. And that's where we left off last week. So I discussed last week that it's not that the Israelites are really good and the Canaanites are really bad. And if you want to hear more about that, go back and listen to last week. Um, the Canaanites are not being kicked out because they're really bad. The Israelites are not getting to occupy Canaan because they're really good. Yahweh has a plan, and that plan involves setting apart a wholly separate space for him to reveal himself to his people, to reveal himself, therefore, to the entire world. It's an act of recreation, of pushing back the darkness and the chaos to form a new garden temple type experience that we see in initially in creation for Yahweh to again dwell with his covenant people. People chosen not because they're good, but chosen to reveal who Yahweh is. Yahweh's intention is not to massacre all the Canaanites, but to drive them out of that space. They're not the rightful owners of the land. Yahweh is. I mentioned last week, how my son got really mad that my daughter walked through his room because there are certain rules in my family of entering each other's rooms. And he said to me, Mom, that's my room. I get to do with it what I want. And I responded, well, it's not really your room. It's actually 
daddy in my house and we have given you this opportunity to live in this room for a certain season of your life. So who owns your room? It's actually daddy and I own your room. But you are allowed to live here. And so that's the same way that Canaan is, picture, is pictured is that Canaan belongs to Yahweh. He has allowed the Canaanites to live in it for a certain amount of time. Now he's going to push them out and allow the Israelites to live there for a certain amount of time. So uh, I mentioned last week the scripture does give us reasons for the conquest. Uh, in Joshua 21, 43 through 45, it says the conquest demonstrates that Yahweh is a covenant-keeping God, that he is more powerful than any other enemy or God. Uh, in Numbers 33, 50 through 56, it says Yahweh intends to drive out the inhabitants of the land so that they don't become barbs and snares to the people of Israel, that they don't cause the Israelites to worship their own God. So it's protection for them. Um, the last two weeks, I've given you ladies a lot of the more detailed historical and biblical context of Joshua. I'm not going to fully dive into that today. We'll do it just in brief. So if you want to hear more about the details of the who, what, when, where, why, go back and listen. Um, but just in brief, um, the question is who wrote this book that we call Joshua? Um, answer is no one actually claims to be the author of Joshua. We don't fully know. We know Joshua wrote parts of it. Uh, Joshua 24, 26 states that Joshua recorded these things in the book of the law of God. We believe that it was written around the time of Joshua or shortly after. And ladies, what's the phrase that helps us believe this? Do you remember what that phrase was that's repeated? Until this day. Good. That we see this phrase repeated throughout Joshua. These things are still occurring till this day. And the one that's really particularly profound is how it says that in Joshua 6.25, the Rahab is still living among the Israelites until this day, which concludes that it had to be written either during the time of the conquest or shortly after because this gal Rahab is still alive. So uh, who was it written to? No specific audience, but based on the theology and the themes, we believe it's intended for the future generations of Israelites, they would continue to have faithful devotion to the one and only sovereign God. Last year, in the Pentateuch study, we talked a lot about how, you can repeat this phrase, those of you who remember it, the Bible is not written to us, but it is written for us. For us. Oh, good job. That the Bible was not written to us Americans living in the 21st century it was not written to us. It was written for us that we would know God and who he is and his purposes through it. But it was actually written to a certain people at a certain time in a certain place. It's written in their language. It's written with their images. It's written in, in with examples that they'll understand. So we always have to have some translation before we apply it directly to our lives. Uh, and then what type of writing is Joshua? Do you ladies remember the phrase? It's We call it... Theological history, exactly. The writers of scripture are not intending to be objective and they're not intending to be comprehensive. They choose to record certain parts of the storyline to show us the overall plot line. They report certain events to show who God is and how we fit into his purposes. And then finally, when does it take place? Well, listen to last week for all the details, but we're going to take a uh, 1 Kings 6, 1 at face value, which says the Exodus occurs 480 years before Solomon builds his, the first temple, which, with doing a little bit of math, places us at the year of 1406 BC. Um, so do you remember, ladies, uh, the main argument that critical scholars use to say that this date is not possible. What don't we see archaeologically in Israel at this time period? Do you remember? We don't see evidence of widespread destruction. So archaeologists say, well, there's no way this whole conquest thing occurred at this time period because we don't see that archaeologically. But remember, ladies, what is wrong with that argument? Anyone remember from week one? That what is Yahweh's intention? Right, right. Yahweh's intention is not to, draw, to destroy all of Canaan. His intention is simply to drive them out. He says that I am giving you cities you did not build. And I'm giving you land and crops you did not grow. Because his intention is to create a new space for the Israelites. 
not to slaughter and destroy all the Canaanites. And we will see there's only three cities that are actually destroyed in Canaan. So it's just a misunderstanding of the narrative to say that we, it couldn't have happened because there's not widespread destruction. Well, there was never an intention to be widespread destruction. All right, so let's, um, let's go to Canaan, shall we? It's time. We are still camped at the city of Shittim in Moab across the Jordan from Canaan. Joshua has given the Israelites three days to get their supplies ready. And during those three days, he sent out the spies to check out the city of Jericho. And then who returned saying, all the people of Canaan have heard about Yahweh and are freaking out. So Yahweh has clearly given us this land. That's the report of these spies. But to enter Canaan, they've actually go, got to go through a physical barrier, and that's the River Jordan. It's spring at this time when the river is at its highest. And I've actually given you ladies on the back side of your notes a picture of the Jordan River at flood stage. This was taken in 1935, and why that's important is because currently the Jordan River has had dams put into it. So it does not flood this way anymore. But in 1935, this was before the dams would have been put in, and you can see what the Jordan River would look like at flood stage. So typically, normally, the Jordan River is 90 to 100 feet wide, about 3 to 10 feet deep, but that increases significantly at flood stage. And uh, we have to remember, this is a whole crew that's trying to pass through. This is babies. This is sheep. You know, this is not just like grown men stomping their way through. Um, so, um, as, so have this picture in your head as we begin to read. So we're going to start in Joshua 3, verses 1 through 5. Were you ladies missing one at, uh, cheat, uh, notes at the end? I think we have an extra one here. Okay. Joshua 3. One through five. Nope, I lied. Joshua, no, nope. yes. Okay, sorry, Joshua three, one through five. Okay, early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan, where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, your God, and the Levitical priest carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you've never been this way before. But keep a distance of about 2,000 cubits between you and the ark. Do not go near it. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Okay, let's pause there for a sec. So, Ark of the Covenant. We remember, this is a gold chest. It has... Uh, Four rings on its four corners. It has gold poles slid into those rings. So it's carried by four men. Um, just a little fun trivia. Anyone remember what's in the Ark of the Covenant? It's three things. Manna, jar of manna. What was? Aaron's rod that had budded. Yep. And the stone tablets of the Ten Commandments. That was just a little fun trivia for the morning. <laughs> Um, okay, so last year we noticed how the Ark of the Covenant is represented as a footstool of Yahweh, that he resides above it. It is not an idol that is to be worshipped. Um, it represents Yahweh's presence in their midst. Now, what do we notice about where the Ark is in relation to the Israelites when they move? Where is it? It's in, it's in the... Front, exactly. So what are the Israelites supposed to do when it moves? They're supposed to follow, exactly. So this is the image that we have for our lives. When the ark moves, when God moves, we follow, right? That he is out in front, he is showing us the path, and our job is simply to follow. When he stays put, we stay put. When he moves, we move. Uh, we look for the movement of God in our lives in our families, in our community, and we join him. The question we should always ask is, where is God going and how do we follow? Because God prepares in advance the path he has for all of us, the work he has for us. One of the scriptures I like just sing over my children all the time is Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's workmanship, 
Um, where we are at God's workmanship, I am, where did my brain go? To do good works, describe, I can sing it. <laughs> For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. And I love that. The works that God has prepared in advance for us to do. So we are simply to join him, to follow him. Um, the word that God has been giving to me all summer, which I feel like he is still giving to me right now, is simply the word yield. It is not stop but it is yield and let him go first. It's just like a pause. I am learning this in everything. I am learning it, um, the whatever God has, not to fight it, but to simply be present in it. When we get kids sick from school, right, we want to fight against it and get mad that, oh, this is messing up my whole week, right? But the word that God keeps giving me is yield, just yield and follow me in whatever I have for this week, for whatever is going on. So God is constantly reminding me of that. He, my job is to yield, to let him go first, that he will provide. The battle is not mine. So how far in front is the ark supposed to be, ladies? What does it say? A thousand yards. yards. So that's an English translation. It's a certain amount of cubits in the Hebrew. Um, What does that say about Yahweh? It says that he is what? He's, if they're supposed to be that far away. Well, like separated or. He's a little, he's a little separated. Yeah. And yeah. He's setting an example. He's setting an example of where to go. Right. That you have to be a certain amount in front um, to know where to go. But it is a sense of his holiness, right? That he is so big and so powerful that they cannot just be simply close to him. But is the ark in some distant place where they cannot see it? No. We get like the twofold nature of God in this image because the ark is in their midst. But so we see the God who is present and comforting and leading, but also this sense of awesome, fearsome, holy, all at the same time that he's present, but he's a little in front. So we, we worship a present God, but also a holy God. In verse 5, it says, uh, what does Joshua tell the people to do? He tells them to consecrate themselves. And then why? For tomorrow, Yahweh will do what? He'll do amazing things. As the Israelites cross the Jordan, it's game on. They are entering as warriors. They are ready for battle. But notice, do they gather their weapons? Nope. They've gathered their food. We talked about that. And what are they supposed to do? They're supposed to to consecrate themselves and to follow. So this is more like a religious procession than a battle march. They're not gathering their weapons. They're consecrating. They're setting themselves apart as holy. And they are following for whatever Yahweh has. Let's keep reading. Okay, verse 6. Yeah, and it doesn't, the question is, what was the consecration? And it doesn't go into the specifics in this moment, but typically that was changing clothes. Sometimes it was abstaining from um, relationships between a man and a woman. Um, There were a couple different things that are described in Exodus at different times where consecration is, but it could have involved a ritual bath of some sort. At this time, They knew what it meant to consecrate themselves, so it's not explained to us. Good question. All right. Uh, Verse 6. Joshua said to the priests, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up and went ahead of them. And the Lord said to Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of Israel, so they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant When you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. Joshua said to the Israelites, come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you, and he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, 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 the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. See, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe, 
And as soon as the priests who carried the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the ark of the covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage, all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan, while the water flowing down to the Sea of the Arabah, that is the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground, while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. Let's pause there for a moment. Okay, so Yahweh gives us two purposes here for this miracle. Verse 7, he says, first, what is it going to do for Joshua? What does it say? It's going to exalt him in whose eyes? In the eyes of Israel. Exactly. So the Israelites would know what? They would know that Yahweh is with Joshua as he was with Moses. So let's ponder this for just one moment. So the word exalt in Hebrew is gadal, meaning to praise, to regard highly, to raise to sort of a higher rank or position. Through this miracle, Yahweh will show that he is with Joshua like he was with Moses. Why will this be important, ladies? They cross the Red Sea. What do they need to know about Joshua? That he's the leader that God has chosen. That he's the leader that God has chosen, exactly. That they can trust Joshua. They are about to go into battles, likely. There is this land ahead of them that they are going to either need to conquer or something's going to have to happen. So they need to know without a shadow of a doubt that when Joshua speaks, that he is speaking for God. Because there's going to be some crazy, like, instructions that are going to happen. Like, we're going to see next time, march around the city seven times. Like, really? Like, this is God's instruction? Okay. So they have to know that when Joshua speaks, he's speaking for God, and that God is fully invested in Joshua as his leader. So in the same way that he was with Moses. So now, why will this miracle cause the Israelites to trust Joshua in this way? Because then I think you began to get at it. What does this miracle remind them of? It reminds them of crossing the Red, the Red Sea. Exactly. In that instance, the Red Sea was a barrier to the Israelites leaving Egypt. Jordan River is a barrier to the Israelites entering Canaan. So what do the Israelites learn about Yahweh's power through these miracles? They learn that what does he control? He controls everything. Nature, he can make a river stand up, he can make it divide if he wants to. So what is Yahweh also saying about the ongoing sense of who he is? He did this one miracle 40 years ago. He's doing the same miracle, same God. Yesterday, today, and forever, same God. The same God that brought them out of Egypt is the exact same God they are still worshiping. The same all-powerful God who defeated the Egyptians is the same all-powerful God that is leading them into Canaan. So um, there's a second reason given also in verse 10. It says, this is how you will know who is among you. What does it say? The The living God. I love that. And that he will certainly drive out the other nations. And this is where we put on our thinking cap for just a sec, okay, so how will this Jordan River crossing prove that Yahweh can drive out the other nations? He's stronger than their gods. He's stronger than their gods, 100%. Exactly. So it's the reminder that Yahweh has defeated the gods of the Egyptians, that the Egyptians couldn't stand against Yahweh. Therefore, none of these nations in the land of Canaan will be able to stand against Yahweh. Same God. So... And why this is important is because the Egyptians still controlled Canaan. They were still the big power. They were the most powerful of all the nations at that time in this area. 
the, Amra the Hittites, the Babylonians, they're powerful too, but in their own areas. So, and then how really is this a bookend? We see it. It's their journey, their 40-year journey begins with a river crossing and ends with a river crossing. So we see this sense of completion. This part of their journey is done and they are now moving into Canaan. So, yeah, go ahead, Babs. That's a good point. They, they did not witness it because they're the children of those who left so Egypt. They just heard the story. Mm. So now they get to see it with their own eyes that God can do it. That is a great point. They had heard the stories, but they had not witnessed. And so now they get to see the same God doing the same miracle. That's a great point, Babs. I love that. Okay, so the people cross over on dry ground. Um, but Yahweh has one more action for the Israelites for the purpose of remembering. Let's read Joshua 4, 1 through 9. When the whole nation crossed out, uh, when the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose 12 men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests are standing, and carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you will stay tonight. So Joshua called together the 12 men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan, each of you to take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, What do these stones mean? You tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant and the Lord, uh, before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So the Israelites did as Joshua commanded them. They took 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, as the Lord had told Joshua. And they carried them over with them to their camp, where they put them down. Joshua set up the 12 stones that had been in the middle of the Jordan, at the spot where the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant had stood. And there they are to this day. All right. So here we have, and I love this, our first, uh, one of our first there until this day comments. Did you notice that at the very end? And they are there until this day, which means when the author wrote this, those stones were still heaped up and standing there. So Yahweh tells Joshua to select 12 men, one from each what? One from each tribe. And each was to take one rock from where the priests were standing in the river and bring that rock, where does it say? To the place where they will stay. Exactly, which ends up being a city called Gilgal. So, and then verse 6, what is the purpose of these rocks? They're to serve as a, a memorial, a sign. A sign for whom? For their, their children, and also grandchildren too. Their children and their grandchildren. When their children see these stones in the future, they'll ask, why are these stones there? And from these stones, the Israelites will tell of the miracles of God. They'll recount his power, that he can control nature. They'll tell of his goodness, of how he keeps covenant with his people who are faithful to him. That he longs for an intimate relationship with his people to dwell in their midst. What does Yahweh not want the Israelites to do? He doesn't want them to forget. Exactly. He does not want them to forget because it's so easy for us to forget, isn't it? The work that God has done in all of our lives. And why? I think because there's always another problem in front of us. So we get through one and we're thankful and then there's another one in front of us as well. Life is good, but it's really easy. Isn't that true? So the stones remind the Israelites that God has taken care of them in the past and will therefore continue to take care of them in the future. I really think that that is what faith is like. That God gives us opportunities to trust him so that we can look back on how he came through for us and trust him again for the future, whatever it will be. Did you have a question, Deb?
stop the flow of water until the priest steps into it, making them have to exercise their faith. And when you do that, that makes it more powerful and you'll remember it longer. That is such a great comment that Deb said that the water didn't stop until they stepped foot into the river, that they had to act in faith before everything, before the river would actually stop, which is such a great comment. It actually reminds me, this is where my brain goes back to, is Indiana Jones and the Holy Grail. Do you <laughs> remember that one? There's that scene where he's approaching the Grail and he can't see the pathway. It's camouflaged in. And do you remember what he gets? He gets a bunch of few stones and he throws it out so he can see. But he has to take that step of faith and then suddenly he realizes that there's a path there in front of him. It was funny. That's the image that came into my head. For those that was born in the 70s, I guess. Um, okay, so... Question. Are the yeah. stones, what the stones picked up? I was thinking about that. I wonder if the stones are still there. I don't know. We, we need Babs to answer that for us. <laughs> we'll have to research that one. But I was thinking about this and this image of faith that, you know, when life gets really hard, as hard things hit us at different times, different, we need to remember God's faithful to us, faithfulness to us in the past and trust him, yield to him in whatever is going on in the present. Um, last year I recorded a podcast with Mandy Pinto, who is a worship leader, and she had, her daughter was diagnosed with cancer at the age of eight, and I, she had just this really profound comment she told me in the, in the podcast. She said, um, she said she and her husband had to decide at that very moment whether they were going to believe everything they'd believed about God their entire lives. And I thought that was so powerful because in the sense that we can say God is good and God is loving and God takes care of us and he provides for us. We can say all those things. But when something gets really hard, it's our moment of acting in belief of those things. That they chose to believe everything about God that they had always believed. That he's good. That he loves them. That their mission is to love others in all circumstances. She said, we realized we were ambassadors in the hospital. We were ambassadors to the nurses. We were ambassadors to the doctors. Um, and trusting in God no matter the outcome because they still believed that God was good and they still believed that heaven was real. So, and their story, their daughter is cancer-free at this point, which is amazing. Um, but that's not always this, the end story for every situation, you know. And so she recognizes that. And she um, had the experience of going to cancer camp with her family and others. And she saw families that that was not their outcome. Um, but that was the comment that struck me. To believe in that moment that God is who he says he is and has, what you've always believed about him. So we all need these stones of remembrance in our lives. We all need things to remind us of who God is and his incredible love for us because it is easy for us to forget. And we need these things that our kids and our grandkids will ask us about so we can tell our stories to them. So this is something I would love you ladies to ponder as a takeaway from today. What could that look like for you? What could stones of remembrance look like in your house? Now, for me, very randomly, and I'm not advocating this for everyone, when I was 19, I put a fish tattoo on my ankle because I wanted to always mark myself as a disciple of Jesus. And my kids ask me about this fish tattoo all the time. Mom, tell me the story of your fish tattoo. So in a weird way, it's a stone of remembrance because I talk about this is my identity as a follower of Jesus. And it's something I'm proud of. Again, I'm not advocating for everyone, different feelings about tattoos. But I remind them that I was caught by a fisherman, that I was redeemed from my sin, and that he has called me to go and make disciples of all nations. So... For, for, so I'd love you ladies to think about what kinds of stones of remembrance can you have in your life, in your house, things that your children, your grandchildren will notice that allows you to share the stories of how God has been faithful to you. And some people do use stones. I'm actually thinking that actually at our women's one day, I think we're going to have a little, because I'm so in, in, in Joshua right now, have uh, stones of remembrance that we're going to take away from it, which I'm excited for. Or they Yes, I'm deciding if we paint them on the spot or if I bring them painted. We'll have to ponder that one. Yes. 
Deb, that's beautiful. So Deb shared that they have a bowl at their house where they have little river rocks and they'll write on them different times that God has been faithful and they pile up in their family. their stones of remembrance. That's beautiful. All right, so um, what now, one connection we can also make is what is the act of remembrance that Jesus has given us, ladies? What are we supposed to do regularly? Communion, that that is an act of remembrance. And what does it remind us of? It reminds us of that through Jesus' death and resurrection, we are all cleansed from our, our sin so that God can dwell in us. We are now the temple where he dwells. We are set apart for his purposes. So in understanding communion as an act of remembrance, like this stone pile, it's actually, I was thinking, it's really a reminder to us, and this was a little bit of a new thought for me, that we really do need to be teaching communion to our kids and our grandkids. Sometimes we see it as this holy thing. You have to be a certain age to do it. But I think the Bible connects the dots as these are different acts of remembrance. And therefore, in the vein of Joshua, it's something we need to be teaching. Why do we do communion? What's the importance of communion? So... Um, Let's finish the story. And we're going to notice two additional reasons our narrator gives us for this miracle. So I'm picking up in verse 10, chapter 4, verse 10. Now the priests who carried the ark remained standing in the middle of the Jordan until everything the Lord had commanded Joshua was done by the people, just as Moses had directed Joshua. The people hurried over. It's a big wall of water. People hurried over. And as soon as all of them had crossed, the ark of the Lord and the priests came to the other side while the people watched. The men of Reuben, Gab, and the half-tribe of Manasseh crossed over ready for battle in front of the Israelites as Moses had directed them. About 40,000 armed for battle crossed over before the Lord to the plains of Jericho for war. That day the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel. And they stood in awe of him all the days of his life. Sorry, I lost my place. There are just as they had stood in awe of Moses. Then the Lord said to Joshua, command the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant law to come up out of the Jordan. So Joshua commanded the priest, come up out of the Jordan. And the priest came up out of the river, carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. No sooner had they set their feet on the dry ground than the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and ran at flood stage as before. On the 10th day of the first month, the people went up from the Jordan and camped in Gilgal on the eastern border of Jericho. And Joshua set up at Gilgal the 12 stones they had taken out of the Jordan. He said, to, he said to the Israelites, in the future, when your descendants ask their parents, what do these stones mean? Tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. Now when all the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all the Canaanite kings along the coast heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan before the Israelites until they had crossed over, their hearts melted in fear, and they no longer had the courage to face the Israelites. Isn't that a great conclusion. <laughs> okay, so this, so in this miracle, one, it caused the Israelites to trust Joshua as their leader for speaking for Yahweh, therefore trusting and following him completely, no matter what crazy instructions are going to come in the future. Two. The Israelites know Yahweh is big enough to be any other God or people group coming against them. So reason three is in verse 24. It says also so that all what? All peoples, all peoples where? Of the whole earth. So that all people in the whole earth would know what? What does it say? The hand of the Lord is powerful. So is this miracle just about the Israelites? No. no, it is not. Again, we see God's purpose is not just that one people group would know him. It's that all people on the whole earth would know that he is God. There is one God, sovereign over everything, every God, every nation, 
who rules nature. And then reason four, that the Israelites and their descendants, verse 24, would do what? They would, what's the word? Fear the Lord. Fear the Lord. Fear Yahweh. We don't really like the word fear, do we? It's not a word that we like in our culture. Fear, though, in Hebrew is the word yaratem, meaning afraid, but also awesome. In English, we think of fear as like dread or terror. Fear of God is more like awe-inspiring reverence. And I have a quote I wanted to read. I have it on your notes, too. This is from Baker Encyclopedia of the Bible. Describes fear in this way. It says, there is, of course, a legitimate place for the fear of God in this sort of lower anxious sense. We are told it is a fearful, terrible thing to fall into the hands of a living God, Hebrews 10, 31. Jesus taught that we should fear him, God, who has the power to punish sin and consign men to utter destruction, Luke 12, 4 and 5. Fear has a constructive role to play in enabling men and women to realize both the degeneracy of their souls and their need for divine forgiveness. The first occurrence of such fear may be found in Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve recoiled from the presence of the holy God, his commandment they had blatantly spurned. Their fear was entirely reasonable, for they had been sternly warned that disobedience would incur a grave judgment. Fear is quite naturally the logical consequence of sin. I like that. Fear is the natural consequence of sin. So I think, to me, a fear is sort of as a as an awareness of my smallness in comparison to God's bigness. That's how I see fear. And I'm glad of it, because it also means that Satan and his emissaries should also be afraid too. But those who are saved by grace, by Jesus, have no need to actually fear God. And Baker Encyclopedia goes on. It says, Jesus Christ, by his atoning death, his resurrection and heavenly intercession for believers, is the unique liberator from fear. The Apostle Paul encouraged the Romans by informing them that in their conversion to Christ, they received the Holy Spirit, not as a spirit of fear and bondage, but as a spirit of adoption, whereby they could address God as Abba. Romans 8.15, the Aramaic word commonly used by Jewish children to address their fathers, like daddy. This is the word by which our Lord Jesus addressed his heavenly father in which Christians, by virtue of their adoption into the family of God, may also use in speaking to God. Galatians 4 or 5. Recipients of God's love have received a dynamic force for casting out their anxieties. 1 John 4, 18. A sense of God's intimate love inspired Paul to say, if God is for us, who can be against us? Romans 8, 31. So the parting of the Red Sea put a holy fear in the Israelites. They watched the Egyptian army be defeated, right? The parting of the Jordan was for the same purpose for the next generation. It was to inspire trust in Yahweh and in his spokesperson, Joshua, and to let all the nations of Canaan know they are currently on the losing team, (laughs) which would hopefully cause them to flee or, like Rahab, choose to join the winning team. Um, Before we close, I wanted to mention um, verse 13 gives us a good opportunity, actually, to do a little review of numbers, which we talked about last year. So this will be a review for most of you. So verse 13 gives us a number of fighting troops from Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. How many does it say there are? It says 40,000. Good. Now, anyone who was here for last year's study, remember, when... What would the Hebrew actually be saying here? It's 40, remember the word? Elifs. 40 elifs. So the exact Hebrew says 40 elifs crossed over. Now, anyone remember what an elif was? It was a military unit. Yes, a military unit, also sometimes a family or a clan. So in Hebrew, this reads... 40 military units or 40 families or clans. So what happened is later in history, an elif gets established 
as a military unit composing of a thousand men. This is later on in history. So it becomes standardized to be a thousand men. So therefore, it becomes known as the number a thousand. But in this early period of Israel, an Eliph wasn't yet standardized to mean a thousand. We don't actually know how many were contained in a military unit, in an elif. It could have even varied by clan. What we can say is that likely these tr three tribes put together 40 military units who crossed over ahead of the Israelites. Did each military unit contain 10 men, 20 men, 30 men? We don't actually know. What, so what's the problem then with translating elif as a thousand? at this time in history. Well, it's the difference between whether 20,000 Israelites left Egypt and are now poised to cross into Canaan or 2 million. So the current population density in the ancient Near East at this time does not support the amount of 2 million Israelites. It also doesn't seem to fit with the other descriptions. Um, we'll notice in two classes from now, in Joshua 7, um, verses four through five, it says three elifs of men are sent to attack the town of Ai. So 36, and then it says 36 Israelite fighting men are killed, which is considered a massacre. That's how they see it. So if 3,000 Israelite troops are sent and 36 die, is that a massacre? That's not a massacre, no. But if three units of 10 to 20 men are sent and 36 die, that is a massacre. That's like all of them are killed. So we also have to consider population growth of the Israelites in Egypt. They arrive with 70 people. And then 400 years later, it says in Exodus 12, 37, it says, the Hebrew literally says, the Israelites traveled from Ramses to Succoth, about 600 elifs of men. Here's another Hebrew word, ragli, besides women and children. Ragli is translated on foot in the NIV, but more likely means foot soldiers, those traveling on foot. So 600 elifs of fighting men left Egypt. If that's 600,000 men, then that would be 2 million likely Israelites. So 70 people to 2 million in, four, in 400 years is a lot of people. That's a huge population growth like potentially possible if every single person had 12 to 14 kids. Um, but, and essentially, and also we have to remember that at this time, all the baby boys were being slaughtered because they were trying to get rid of the Israelites and they were being um, forced to do hard labor. So that's not allowing that kind of population growth as well. So if it were 600 troops of fighting men, the IVP background commentary suggests it's more like 20,000 people would have left Egypt, which is a way more realistic number for this time period and for entering Canaan. Besides, if two million people were about to enter Canaan, I mean, they, everyone clearly would have been running. Like, that would be a huge, overwhelming onslaught migration of people. It's just not sustained at that time period. So it's not that the Bible is wrong. It's just understanding what is the correct translation of this word, elifs. And it's, and that idea is, is it's military units, fighting clans versus a thousand. And the reason that it's called a thousand is because later in time, a military unit gets standardized to be a thousand people. All that makes sense? Fun facts. This is like the nerd in me that loves all this. All right. I'm going to stop there for today. So I uh, would love you ladies to stay and chat at your tables for a little while. Questions you can ponder and discuss together is what do we learn about God through the narrative of the crossing of the Jordan, what do we learn about his plan for Canaan? Um, share any just new observations or insights you ladies had today. And then also, I'd love it if you'd share prayer requests. And I'll kind of wander around. Feel free to pull me in. Um, or I'll just listen.